Aver versus Saver in, in, in iris surgical patients. So the hypothesis was at that time that TAVR was not inferior to SAVR. They include 700 patients and the mean age of the patient was 83 years old. So I think that when you uh, talk with your patient in clinic, it's really important that you know at least the mean age of the patient in each um, category of a group just to have the same conversation and the proper conversation uh, with your patient according to TAVR versus SAVR. Uh, they use the first generation valve. Uh, they randomized the patient to Saver and Paver. So 100 uh, patient uh, had alternative access. At that time, it was transapical and uh, direct aortic. The primary endpoint was death from any cause at one year, and it was an intention to treat analysis. And the rates of death from any cause were 3.4% in the transcatheter group versus 6.5% in the surgical group at 30 uh, days, which was not uh, clinically, uh, clinically significant, and 24 versus 26% uh, at one year. So basically, TAVR uh, was found to be non-inferior to SAVR in those iris patients. Um, the other, so uh, so the, the, the result continued to f up to five years. So basically it shows no significant uh, difference in between those groups, though it was not inferior. And you can see at five years, the number of patients that was left uh, in both groups as well. Uh, so I did the same for the core valve uh, patient with the Medtronic trial. Uh, 800 patients were included in the States. Mean age was the same, 83 years old. The primary endpoint was the rate of death from any cause at one year. It was a non-inferiority and superiority testing. And in the S-treated analysis, the rate of death from any cause at one year was significantly lower in the TAVR group than in the surgical group, 14% versus 19%. It was significant for non-inferiority and superiority. And uh, the results were similar in the intention to treat analysis. So those are the five year results of five year. So the difference is mainly in the first years and after at five year, there's no significant difference in between the, the group and those iris patient. So I think it is fair to say that TAVI is as good as surgery for iris patient, especially those patients that are um, 80 year old and over. I think it's a no brainer now that we're gonna uh, try to see if those are potential TAVI candidate first. And if not, we're going to uh, assess the surgical risk of the of these patients thereafter. The thing is with the IRIS trial, we saw more patients coming to our clinic. So basically the one that were not referred initially. So I found that we are operating, maybe we're doing a lot of TAVI in those patients, but we are still operating a lot of those patients also who have like anatomic contraindication for TAVR procedure if we assess that the risk is uh, acceptable for these patients. So what about the intermediate risk patient? It happened in 2016. Uh, the mean age was still 82 years old. It was more patients that were included in this trial, 2,000 patients. Primary endpoint was death from any cause or disabling stroke at 24 months. 76% um, of the cohort was transfemoral, 24% uh, were transthoracic. And the composite uh, was similar uh, for non-inferiority in this cohort. And the cohort of TF TAVR, there was less death or disabling stroke than surgery. And for the transthoracic, the results were similar. And uh, you can see the results at five years still, uh, uh, it's comparable and with uh, a little bit more patient uh, at five years than the partner one A trial. For the Medtronic trial, it was a composite of death from any cause of disabling stroke at 24 months, uh, 1,700 patients that were included. The mean age was slightly lower, 79 years old. It was not inferior TAVI over surgery, but you can see that for the surgical patient, there was more acute kidney injury, AFib, and transfusion. And for the TAVR patient, there was uh, more residual AI and pacemaker. And I five year, I think that this data is important and we're gonna see in the lowest patient that the five year, more, there was more re-intervention for aortic valve, 2% TAVI versus 0.8% SAVR. And that was due to valve thrombosis. Um, now uh, with partner three, um, so a thousand patients were included, TF TAVR versus surgery. There was no alternative access. The primary endpoint was uh, death, stroke, or rehospitalization at one year. It was a non-inferiority and superiority trial with a mean age of 73 years old. And here are the slides um, from the presentation from the company. So basically, 
all cause that you you cannot see there's no significant difference between both groups so um you can see the number of patients here at five years uh, all stroke was significant at the, um, the beginning uh, in favor of TAVR, but after there's no significant difference between the groups. And for the rehospitalization, so the composite is really driven uh, in favor of TAVR uh, in terms of rehospitalization that we have a little bit more in surgery. In terms of the additional clinical endpoint from this trial, so you can see that for the aortic valve re-intervention, there's no difference between groups endocarditis, no difference. Valve thrombosis is still an issue in those TAVR patients. AFib for surgery, new pacemaker, a little bit more, uh, but not significantly in the TAVR group. Uh, no difference in terms of MR, more serious bleeding uh, for surgery, and no difference in reverse polarization between both groups. Uh, bioprosthetic valve failures to five years, there's no significant difference between both groups. And in conclusion, so uh, they found that um, both PAVR and surgery were associated with similar and low clinical event, ra event rates. Um, there's difference in, in the primary composite endpoint rate, which favored TAVR at one year, but it was attenuated after five years. And there's other important endpoints that were either similar for both therapies, such as new pacemaker and reintervention, in favor of TAVR for new AF and serious bleeding, and in favor of surgery with mild par uh, paravalvular leak and valve thrombosis, which I found is uh, quite significant. Uh, so the improvements in integrated valve hemodynamics were maintained for both therapies at five years. In terms of the VARG-3 definition of bioprosthetic valve failure and SVD, it was similar and infrequent in both therapies. So you have 3.3% for TAVR and 3.8% uh, for surgery. Uh, so there's encouraging signs of uh, for favorable valve durability, but the 10-year follow-up is planned. And there's marked one-year improvement in patient report outcomes uh, with both therapies. For the Evolut low risk patients, so they include 1,400 patients. The mean age was 74 year old. Um, when 850 patients had reached the 12 month follow up, they analyzed the data regarding the primary endpoint and uh, for the composite of death or disabling stroke at 24 months using uh, the Bayesian method. And here, um, those are the recent four-year outcome for the Evolute Low Risk Trial. So basically, as you can see, and that's what they showed like with the TVT registry, there's a trend in transcatheter and surgical aortic valve replacement in the US that show yearly increase in the overall number of TAVR procedure and significant growth in TAVR utilization among younger adults with aortic stenosis. So, there, we don't have the same tendency here um, in Canada, but it's uh, fairly uh, strong um, in the U.S. And you can see here, SAVR is decreasing and TAVR is increasing for the patients that are more than 65 years old. And um, I don't know if you're familiar with the Notion trial. I didn't uh, put slides, but those we have the 10-year data for the lowest patient. And what they said is that the long-term data are limiting, are, are limited in all common lower risk patient. And in the notion 10 years, 37% of patients survived the 10 years. And the rates of valve degeneration as assessed by various measures of structural valve deterioration were significantly lower in all patient treat with the first generation co uh, core valve compared with the surgery because the notion trial used the first generation as well. Um, so, um, so those are the 10-year results of the Notion trial, and you can see the number of patients that were fairly low um, at the end of the study. And here for the uh, severe SVD, you can see that there's a little bit more in the surgical group than in the um, than in the TAVR group, but that's using core valve. So we have fairly good results with the core valve and uh, not so with the sapien. I think that definitely the core valve will have uh, better durability than the sapien valve, but uh, these uh, results needs to be shown as well on the long term. In terms of the valve performance, there's significantly less BVD with core valve uh, platform compared to the surgery. Here, that's the thing that they showed at five years, at four years, sorry. 
and the biroprosthetic valve dysfunction was associated with approximately 50% increased risk of death, cardiovascular death, and rehospitalization in all ADR at five years. Um, and it was definitely the valve performance uh, correlates with the clinical outcomes in those patients. In terms of the evolutive low risk, there was no significant difference in between groups. So the mean age was 73, 74 year old. Um, for the patient that represent the patient that are, were less than 70, it was approximately 20% of the cohort of patient. It's about the same in the partner trial. 30% uh, like all the cardiovascular trial represent a female patient. Um, and there's no difference uh, in the ejection fraction of these patients. And here, um, so there's significant, so in terms of the bioplastic valve performance of five years, um, there are significantly less mean gradient uh, that are uh, more than 20 and severe PPM with the Evolute platform compared to the SAVR. Um, so you can see in terms of the severe PPM, it was 3.5 versus 1.1, which we, which is the number that we have in the literature for the surgical cohort of patient. There's no difference in terms of endocarditis, and for them, there's no difference in terms of uh, clinical and subclinical uh, valve thrombosis. In terms of the mortality, uh, there is a survival benefit, but on the limit, 0 0.05 uh, for um, TAVR versus SAVR. So those number, um, the, the tendency and the trends continue over the years. There's uh, no difference in terms of stroke and uh, no difference in terms of all-cause mortality if you look at those uh, two, uh, in, in terms of the observed difference in the primary endpoint, and that was uh, driven by death. And um, in terms of the composite, um, there's a significant difference in between groups, and this includes rehospitalization as well. Uh, in terms of all cause mortality for the secondary endpoint, you can see no difference. What was different is the composite here driven by rehospitalization. More pacemakers, significantly more with the TAVR uh, Evolute platform than the Sapien platform. Uh, permanent pacemaker implant is the same. And um, atrial fibrillation more in the surgical group and no difference in terms of re-intervention between both patients. Um, okay, so um, in terms of the consideration from this trial, so the patients enrolled in the evolute low risk study were on the higher end of the spectrum of low risk patient owing to the minimal number of exclusion by the National Steering Committee. The patient enrolled in the evolute low risk at an average age of 74, and 23% of patients were under 70. So comparative outcomes in, in much younger patients will require additional study. The surgical operator proficiency and surgical valve selection and sizing were best in class surgery, but annular enlargement was performed only in less than 5% of the patient. And the effect of larger surgical valve sizing with annular enlargement will require additional study. This report provides an analysis of ART clinical endpoints four years after AVR, and patient will be followed for 10 years to determine whether there is additional divergence of the clinical uh, outcome curves. And the higher pacemaker rate in the study has been lowered to less than 10% at 30 days in the TVT registry with refinement uh, in the procedural technique with the, the cusp overlap that they showed with the, the core valve platform. Um, the TAVR patient in the Evolute Loris trial continued to show durable outcomes for the primary endpoint and significantly better hemodynamics than SAVR through four years. There's 26% relative reduction in hazard for death or disabling stroke with Evolute TAVR compared to SAVR at four years, and the curve continued to diverge over time. Significantly lower mean gradients and higher EOAs with Evolute TAVR, which is uh, subannular, uh, TAVR versus SAVR at all follow up time points. So there's definitely, um, um, I said so, but the supranular uh, valve is definitely an advantage for the hemodynamics. 85% of Evolute TAVR patients had non trace PVR, and there was no difference between groups in moderate or greater PVR. And indicators of valve performance, including eye gradient at four years, severe PPM, and endocarditis, overall favored TAVR with similar low thrombosis rates in both groups. 
Um, Evolute does report lower rate of death or disabling stroke versus state-of-the-art surgery that are div diverging. So I'm repeating myself. Uh, superior hemodynamics and interstructural uh, valve deterioration was fairly low and uh, be better valve uh, performance. So um, in terms of those trials, okay, to be eligible for the trials, patient had to meet strict inclusion and exclusion criteria, as you know, and those were mainly the exclusion criteria. So basically, that's a lot of patients that we currently see in our practice, so bicuspid, severe LV dysfunction, severe calcification of the valve complex, um, complex CAD, low coronary takeoff, mixed aortic disease, extreme analyst size. Um, so basically that's a lot of patients that we see in our practice and those data, it's an indicator, but should not be extrapolated to all patients. And basically you need to know the data, but our judgment and how we consult the patient after it's really the key. And sometimes it's hard to see the patient that comes to our office and the cardiologist told them that they're going to have a tavern. And after just, you need really to be cognizant of, of who was included in those trials and what are the results and how long are the results because you really need sometimes to just undo mm -hmm. what was done by the cardiologist when you see your patient. And basically, especially if you do both and you're, you are including both TAVR and surgical. So I think that you have a lot of credibility to very... Uh, recommend what will be the best option for your patient. Um, do you want to comment or ask questions about the trials? I didn't go into deep dive. I just spoke a little bit more about the low-risk patient, but do you have any comments or something that you need to add on those trials? Or you can think for the... Um, questions period. Okay. So um, contemporary surgical results. So I think that it's very important that as surgeons now we have um, more contemporary data. So with the comments trial with the Resilia and Spirus aortic valve. Um, so the last results of five years was uh, were presented at SDS 2021. The mean age of those patients was 69 years old. There was no structural valve deterioration PVL in 95% of the patient. The majority of the valve implants were 23, 25. All cause mortality uh, early was 1.2% and late mortality was 2.2%, which is good. And the early pacemaker implant rate was 4.7%. So in the literature, like in the um, STS registry, um, we can see that 60% of the valve that are implant are less and 23 and less. So I think that in the comments trial, like we don't know like the rate of annular enlargement, but they put like the surgeon in those trials, the, like the, I think they did an effort to put really bigger valve or the patients were selected that way. Um, there's another uh, paper by Morjani that was uh, presented Journal of uh, Cardiac Surgery. So a thousand patients, 60 year old, mean age 75, the mortality is really low. 1.1% and uh, survival rate at one and two years is 94%, 92% respectively, um, which significantly decreased with the surgical risk and age. Obviously, the pacemaker rate was 1.2% and the majority of the valve implants was 21, 23, and 25. And here you can see um, in terms of the SAVR, they compare high risk to TAVR, intermediate risk, low risk, low risk with the partner three and the notion trial. Those were the, the first year of the trial. So 30 day mortality, uh, 4.7 in the surgical high risk cohort compared to 3.4% in the intermediate risk. It's uh, lower in the low risk for TAVR, but still it's fairly good in the high risk population of patient. The stroke rate was low in the score. The 30 day pacemaker implantation was not too bad. And the one year survival was a little bit less than the TAVR patient, but 84% in those high risk population. This was a paper that was written by uh, Dr. Khalil Khalil from University of Montreal for the change in outcomes over time in intermediate risk patient treated for severe aortic stenosis. So basically we include a 812 patient. There was no difference in mortality between TAVR and SAVR. 
Uh, basically, we compare the patient who present our institution um, and who will undergo TAVR versus SAVR. There's different complications that we need to know, like more TIA, pacemaker, perivalvular leak in the TAVR patient, more acute kidney injury, AFib, delirium, bleeding, and, and longer length of stay in those SAVR patients. And basically, what you can see, there's any way, like compared to the different period, in terms of all the outcomes, the mortality and the morbidity, there's a difference in in the trends of mortality and morbidity. So uh, better technique, more cognizant, we refer better the patient. So those were all comers who came for aortic stenosis who had TAVR or SAVR. But I think that because we have both options, we can really offer what is safer uh, uh, for our patients. So who should have surgery, who should have TAVI? So basically you need to have a pretty good and functional art team. Um, because in terms of the guidelines, so you saw with the 2020 ACCHA guidelines that for patients that are 50 to 65 years old who require AVR and do not have a contraindication to anticoagulation, it is reasonable to individualize this choice of either a mechanical or bioprosthetic AVR with consideration of individual patient factors and after informed shared decision making. For symptomatic patients with CVRS who are 65 to 80 years old and have no anatomic contraindication to transfemoral TAVI, either SAVR or transfemoral TAVI is recommended after shared decision making about the balance between expected patient longevity and valve durability. So basically, for the European guidelines, they kept like the 75 years old. So um, I think that this this was really controversial to read that. And as surgeon, I would be interested to know your opinion about that um, during the um, the, the questions at the end. Uh, for symptomatic patients with CVRS who are more than 80 years old of age or for younger patients with a life expectancy less than 10 years and no anatomic contraindication to transfer TAVI, transfer TAVI is recommended in preference to SAVR. So I think that this is fine. And you have all after like the possible scenario in those younger patient or Saver, Tavi, Tavi, Saver, Saver, Tavi, Tavi, Saver, Tavi, whatever. So basically, I don't know what you judge uh, to be reasonable for a patient. Is it one procedure over a lifetime? Is it two procedure? What is reasonable? I think that three starts to be too much for the number of procedure over a lifetime. But um, we can definitely discuss about that as well. In terms of my practice, so patients who are more than 70 years old with uh, a, without any contraindication to TAVI, I think that they should have TAVI no matter the risk category. And uh, a younger, low-risk patient should definitely have SAVR. Uh, and a younger, intermediate-risk patient or a younger, high-risk patient. So I think TAV SAVR is, is a good option. So basically, um, you need to be... Um, honest with your patient about the risk that you're going to do, but you need to think about what will be the best durability for your patient not to come back like in five years later with the same problem. But for sure, there's some patients that are willing to take low risk or perhaps even consider less favorable outcomes in order to achieve a therapy which suit their particular lifetime or their particular health and age at that time. And it's really your mentality, your institution, your art team that will decide if you refuse because you don't find that the, the procedure is reasonable and to refer to uh, another center if you don't feel comfortable with this. But definitely our mentality in Canada is definitely not the same as in the States because in the States, colleagues are saying that I know that I can do a better tavern than the other institution at the other corner of the street. So it's best that I do it myself than refer someone somewhere else who's going to have like less good outcomes for TAVR than me doing it. But anyway, um, okay. When I see a patient, I think about all this. So basically for the, I think it's it's longer and longer our discussion that we're having as part of the heart team, because we need to talk about, to think about durability, even if we don't have those long-term results that we have in surgery. We should definitely consider subclinical thrombosis, anticoagulation, concomitant other disease, paravalvular leaks, PPM, reaccess to coronary, bicuspid valve, reoperation, pacemaker. So 
and we have access now. So basically the discussion will be between surgery and TAVR, but we also have access to other TAVR platform. So I think that the, we have a lot of discussion about what will be the best transcatheter valve. So the technology is evolving so much and we have access to so many things. And uh, are we gonna put like a cerebral protective device and stuff like that? So basically those are really nice and, and but longer conversation now. Um, so in terms of the PPM, okay, there are still surgical series. In the surgical series, even in the contemporary data, PPM is still an issue. So uh, we did a sub-study from the partner through A, and in the sub-study, it was not moderate, it was severe PPM, 33% of the patient had severe PPM in the surgical arm. And we know in our surgical literature that it is associated with all cause and cardiac mortality. In a TAVERS sub-study of partner, only severe PPM was associated with cardiac mortality. And our surgical cohort, even like moderate PPM is associated with cardiac mortality and morbidities. And in terms of the PPM, TAVI is a little bit better than SAVR for, especially for the small analy. And um, so we need to uh, think about all this. Here uh, in the partner three trial, the lowest patient. So here in the TAVR cohort, we have 53% of moderate PPM, 8% of severe PPM. This is an intra-annular valve. And for the surgery, we have a little bit less moderate PPM, but about the same for the severe PPM here. So for the intra-annular valve, I think it's pretty uh, comparable what we have depending of, of, the, of the study. So it was not in the partner three, but it uh, it was not in the partner two A, but it, it is in the partner three. So maybe there was more root enlargement or something like that. But in terms of, of the percentage of the partner three, there was not that much like we saw. Um, in terms of the TVT registry, so basically we have 12% of severe PPM in all the TVT registry for TAVR and approximately 25% of moderate PPM in those TAVR valve. So basically, so in terms of the advantage of using a supraannular valve versus an intraannular, so you can definitely uh, talk about the hemodynamics and the PPM. And it seems like the patients that are doing TAVR mention that uh, their severe PPM or moderate PPM is not associated with uh, cardiac mortality. But I think that even in the surgical literature, we saw we see that a little bit more in the long term. So it will have, it will have to be seen. In terms of the paravalvular leak, current THV transcatheter heart valve match and may exceed the hemodynamic performance of surgically implanted bioprosthesis based on pressure gradient and EOA. However, these hemodynamic criteria do not account for PVL. And I don't know if you know like the concept of energy loss. So the ventricles become the focus of evaluation rather than the systolic valve function. With, uh, with the PVL, you generate a higher diastolic stress. And this is a study, well, it was published in 2009, it has been a while, but um, it is a ventricle, so they mentioned that it is the ventricle that must raise its systolic pressure and volumetric capacity to overcome added energy loss and supply blood flow at the necessary rate. And um, they mentioned that in the presence of even a mild paravalvular leak, a transcatheter art valve implantation imposes significantly higher workload on the left ventricle than an equivalently sized surgically implanted bioprosthesis. And here you can see that in all trials, so those are the intermediate risk trial, the percentage of mild PVL is still in TAVR like between 20 like and 30%, a bit more in the core valve cohort. Um, and in the partner three trial, you have at least like 30%. Uh, at 30 days and one year of mild PPL. So that will have to, as a consequence, so here, this is the longer data with the notion trial, PVL of ventricular remodeling. So you can see between both groups that you have less uh, regression of the LV mass if you have PVL. Um, and in blue, you have the SAVR, so there's more regression compared to TAVR. Uh, the change in end diastolic volume is less with the... Um, TAVR patient. And in the in terms of the remodeling, you stay with the TAVR in your concentric hypertrophy. And with your SAVR patient, you go from concentric hypertrophy to concentric remodeling. So 
it's it's better really for the ventricle and we should not minimize mild perivalvular leak. In terms of the durability of TAVI, it is less known because we have like between five and 10 years results. Um, the risk of bioprosthetic failure at 20 years after SAVR is less than 10% in patient over 70 that we know. And the predictor of SVD, otherwise in the surgical cohort is patients that are younger, the PPM and the higher uh, gradient and worse hemodynamics of the valve. Um, Blackman and Jack 2019 did a study on SVD um, in terms of the TAVI, five and 10 years. It was done from a UK registry. The mean age was 79 years old. There was 91% freedom from SVD at five years. And the cause of that was, again, thrombus. In a meta-analysis that was done um, by Lair, there's a high rate of one in five years of PVL, moderate CVAI, and re-intervention um, in patients who, who present uh, who had a TAVR. SVD was 7% at five years, but only 12% of them underwent re-intervention, and those was just because those are iris patient and uh, and um, they decide not to intervene because of a higher surgical risk. Subclinical thrombosis. So basically with the leaflets already in place, you lose that vortex effect in the sinuses. So basically that's what we see when we explain the prosthesis. So there is a lot of like uh, chunky material and thrombus that um, accumulates uh, between your native leaflet and also your um, the transcatheter valve leaflet. And um, in the partner three trial, otherwise, there is, a, there is a signal for subclinical thrombosis between two and five years. In Sertivy trials, we have a signal in the intermediate up to five years. And um, Michael Mack, noted that the valve thrombosis definition by the VARC-2 criteria are outdated and may be exaggerated by recent CT imaging leaflet nickname study, but this needs to be uh, seen as well. But if you have valve thrombosis, it usually correlates with higher gradient in your, in your, uh, in your valve. Um, it's not obvious to see the thrombus or the subclinical thrombus on CT. Um, every time we asked for, we didn't see it that well, but I think that if it's obvious and if the gradient, you can see it. I saw some scan that really showed the, the thrombus, but basically you need to anticoagulate your patient, hospitalize your patient, do a CT scan and check if it's gonna change something on the gradients. So that's why the TAVR patient are followed at one year and after they have a repeated echo every year. In terms of the concomitant lesion, what are we doing with asymptomatic CAD? Um, there is complete TAVR trial that are trying to figure it out if we should revascularize before, revascularize after, or just observe what will happen. Um, we don't have the answer yet. What we do with uh, mitral and tricuspid regurgitation, aortic aneurysm, or um, with the patient, what will be the, tr the treatment with patient with mixed disease? Um, in terms of the partner three trials, so in terms of the concomitant procedure, so they were randomized. There was there was not supposed to have concomitant procedure, but some occur in eight percent of the of the TAVR patient. And but the thing is, thirty five percent of the surgical patients. So even if the surgeon didn't plan or those patients were randomized, the surgeon still decided to do a mitral valve replacement or repair TVR cabbage, maize. So there's a, a lot of concomitant procedure, a lot more than in the TAVR procedure that obviously add to the surgical risk of those patients, even in those cohort of patients, because like we're not going to leave that. In the evolute low risk, so in terms of the concomitant procedure was 7% for the TAVR patient versus 26% in the surgical cohort as well. In terms of the presence of CAD, so we see a lot more, like uh, so up to 60, 80% in the iris patient cohort, in the lower patient for pre uh, prevalence of CAD at the same time, so it's between like uh, 15 and like 25% of patients um, that present with lower patient. And uh, of course, uh, the exclusion criteria was uh, syntax score more than 22 in the partner three trial and syntax score more than 20, uh, 32 
they were excluded, but all the other patients were included. And that's why some of the surgeon bypass those patients as we usually do. Uh, so those are the number that I told you in terms of concomitant PCI in cabbage uh, that were performed in those patients uh, during the, the study period. And um, in terms of the coronary reaccess, um, there's definitely a lack of direct visualization of the aortic root during THV implant uh, because of the interplay of the implanted valve commissure, the aortic root geometry, the displaced aortic valve leaflet, and that can limit access to coronary osteopus TAVR. And an MDCT study of TAVR patient found that 51% of cases the ostium of one or both of the coronary arteries was blocked by the neocommissure of the THV valve. One study reported 10% rate of acute coronary syndrome after TAVR with 47% of cases occurring within uh, the first year. So now we have like techniques to align the commissure with some of the um, platform that we have. And we have like little marker. And I think that it's really in the objective of the industry just to, um, to allow us to better uh, align the, the commissure just to reaccess the coronary thereafter. It's really more difficult to reaccess the coronary if you have a supraannular valve as well. So sometimes in those younger iris patients, like the like the cardiologist, I, I do not really necessarily agree with that. They will prefer to put an intraannular valve just to reaccess the coronary. But at the same time, in those younger patients, you want more durability. So I tend to prefer a supranular valve. So there's always discussion regarding this. So in terms of the mitral regurgitation, uh, functional MR will improve in 50 to 60% of the patient post AVR. And there's a lack of improvement if you have congestive heart failure and large left atrium and post-op AI. And in terms of the partner trials, patient with residual moderate to severe MR had higher mortality than none to mild MR. So you need to evaluate what is the mechanism of the functional MR. And instead of doing a TAVR, just refer those patients for surgery if you don't feel that the MR will improve after the, the, the TAVR procedure. Um, we don't have a lot of data on that. And when we speak with the electrophysiologist, like what is the significance of a left bundle branch uh, block? They don't really tell us, but in some study, it has been related to one-year cardiac mortality. And um, pacemaker increased mortality at one year and doubled the risk of heart failure or readmission. But I think that more literature needs to be done, especially in those younger patients, on the effect of that. In terms of the bicuspid aortic valve, we still do TAVR, especially if they don't have a RAFE, or if they don't have a calcified, a very calcified RAFE. Um, so we need to be careful about the morphology and the phenotype of the bicuspid aortic valve just to plan um, to prevent the complication. We always put a cerebral protection device for the bicuspid uh, just for protection. Uh, you cannot see really well uh, this thing, uh, this slide, but there's a two times stroke rate as well uh, versus the, the tricuspid um, in terms of the very calcified raphe. But I think that with the non-calcified and the not too, like with one raphe, not too calcified, I think we can have the same result, surgical versus TAVR, but still you need to be cognizant of there is a risk. Um, and, and, um, and of course, the dimension of all components of the AV complex are generally larger in BAV than TAV. And several studies on CT or transesophageal echo for BAV have described a similar circular ge geometry of the aortic annulus as that find in uh, tricuspid aortic valve. The supraannular geometry, especially at the level of the sinus, is more elliptical in BAV patients. So that's why at some point they started to size the THV valve uh, based on the supraannular um, dimension, but we don't do that. Um, the EV complex shape is non-tubular or flared or tapered in two-thirds of the BUP patient like this. So you need to look at the anatomy when you plan a procedure. 
Uh, and the narrowest dimension and point of the highest resistance of the AV complex may be located above the annulus at the commercial level, especially in those with a tri-commercial raphic type anatomy, which may contribute to a less circular uh, deployment. And if you oversize your THV, um, you can have a subsequent risk of TAV under expansion or analyst injury if size according to the analyst dim dimension. So you just need to be careful. Um, and when localized between the right coronary cusp and the left coronary cusp, the RAFE may also indirectly induce conduction disturbance through an increase of the compression force applied on the contralateral stent frame towards the non-coronary cusp area, which is very close to the is bundle. So you can have more uh, pacemaker at that level. So um, when is favorable to do transcatheter art valve for bicuspid? Um, Tricommercial bicuspid aortic valve with incomplete RAFE, Severs type one with non-calcified RAFE or incomplete, Severs type zero if circularity is preserved, Analyst dimension with transcatheter art valve sizing range in the range because if sometimes it's out of range, uh, homogeneous and moderate calcified leaflet and absence of aortopathy or aortic dimension. Okay, so you always need to check the aorta um, when you should not be doing it and it refers for surgery. Severs type one with heavily calcified raffi and excess leaflet calcification definitely severs type two. Extreme elliptic uh, shape, highly calcified leaflet. Circumferential classification, highly calcified left ventricular outflow tract, low calcium burden and large annulus, sometimes uh, represent with mixed aortic regurgitation and aortic stenosis, shallow sinus and long calcified leaflet or low coronary takeoff, and anomaly of coronary implantation. Okay. Um, so for those younger iris patients, there's challenges. So the reaccess to coronaries, the commissural alignment for the future, the amodynamics and the durability, and the possibility to do valve and valve. And it, it can be valve and valve, tav in, in, um, in a, a saver valve, or tav and tav. So basically, you need to think about all this because you cannot just put a taver valve if you don't have a plan for the future or put a biological valve in a younger patient and saying without a doubt that you're going to put a TAVR valve in valve in the future either. So what is the choice of TAVI prosthesis? So basically we have like the iteration of valve is like uh, booming every year. We have a new generation of valve. And um, so the intraannular valve is balloon expendable, cobalt chromium, um, it's a bovine pericardial valve. It has high radial strength. So this is really a workhorse uh, valve. It's really easy to implant. Is it the best in dynamic? Am I worried about the, the thrombosis? Yes. I'm putting less and less 23 uh, sapient valve because I think that the durability will be less, even like it's the same thing with our small prosthesis uh, with the 19 valve. So... Um, this is the thing that we need to think about. Is it better to put a 23 versus a 26 core valve or another valve such as the accurate or the, uh, I have a blank, but the, the new one from Boston, uh, from Abbott. Um, you have the delivery system and the sheet that change over time. So the delivery system, there's a flex component just to prevent stroke rate and like, just going on the outer curve of the aorta and then bringing all the calcium with you. Uh, so you can stay in the middle of the aorta, the introducer in terms of the vascular complication decrease over time. Uh, and you have the self-expanding valve. So I, I didn't present like all the type of valve um, because I those are the two most common and those are the one that are um, most data on it. Uh, so you have, have self-expendable porcine pretty pericardial tissue valve with a nitinol wire frame. There's less radial force, but still are very performant. They have their skirt, but in terms of the supranular, you have to have good technique like to uh, reaccess the coronaries. Um, you can go in line, so you don't have to put a sheet and put your valve, so it's directly, so it stays 14 French. 
uh, and there's the option to recapture and reposition the valve. In terms of the choice of the prosthesis, the difference between both in terms of the balloon expandable. So this alternative kit, I'm not a fan of it because they didn't do new iteration of that. So it stayed like 18 French and 21 French. So especially that now that our alternative access is mainly carotid or trans auxiliary, I'm not a fan of this, okay? Because I think it's too big. So I usually use the accurate Neo2 or the, um, the core valve. Uh, Evolute Pro Plus to do it. Um, I think there's less pacemaker in the Edwards. It's easier uh, reaccess to the coronary. You can do valve and valve mitral or tricuspid. You can use it um, because there, it has more radial force. You don't want to cause annular rupture, but still, if the the leaflets are really really calcified, uh, I think it's best. Uh, it's easier for redo procedure for us. Uh, for the Medtronic smaller vessels. Uh, patient with calcified LVOT or STJ just to prevent the rupture. In terms of the bicuspid, this is the only one that is approved. Small analyte, uh, better hemodynamics. Uh, you can do valve and valve in our surgical bar prosthetic uh, because it has better hemodynamic. It is recapturable. And um, you can use it if there is a mitral prosthesis in place. So basically they say that because you don't have the balloon that can eject your valve because of the mitral prosthesis, but the data comparing balloon expendable and self-expendable didn't show a difference if you have a mitral prosthesis in place. Um, so we tend to use both. So it's not really uh, advantage of the self-expendable valve and it's better for LV dysfunction because of no rapid pacing, but I don't believe in that either. So, In terms of the access, um, I think that the one that are mostly done is transcarotid, uh, transaxillary, uh, I didn't transubclavian, uh, transfemoral in majority, but we don't do that. I didn't do a transapical or a direct aerotic for the last three years, I think. And uh, we don't, uh, in Ottawa, they do transcaval, I think. I don't know if they're still doing it. And I do sometimes when the brachiocephalic trunk is really accessible and it's long, I like to do it. So I don't do an incision. I just lift the the manubrium and uh, with uh, a retractor and I can have access to the brachiocephalic trunk. So sometimes I do that. Uh, so we are doing it in an hybrid room. I think that some of the center in Canada do it in the um, interventional uh, cath lab, but I think it's best to do it there. Um, the anesthesiologist for us is there, okay? At some point we tried to ask them not to come and just to come in terms of emergency, but they refuse. So they are still there. They're still in the arterial line. There's no central line. There's no Foley catheter. Um, the pump is prime, but the perfusionist is not in the room anymore, but uh, they know the weight of the patient. And if they have to bring the cannula, they know about the patient and, um, and there's no TE, no TTE either, uh, no intubation, um, unless we do uh, alternative access. Um, so basically the conscious sedation brings like less cognitive impairment, better hemodynamics, faster recovery and reduced length of stay. So this has been proven in the 3M protocol that uh, David Wood did. Um, in terms of the step of the procedure, you need to do, uh, so you have puncture on both sides of the groin. So you have one, so we tend to pace more on the on the wire now, if we if the patient do, do not have any uh, abnormality at the EKG that could make him at risk of having a pacemaker after. So basically we don't do that venous access. We do it as a central line. So basically we just put a five French we pace on the wire. If we feel that we need to install a pacemaker, we do it uh, over a seven, uh, seven French introducer. We put a six French for our pigtail catheter. We have our delivery access site. Um, and uh, basically we put the pigtail, we do the aortic root shot. We look that the sinuses are well aligned, the nadir of the sinuses. Um, <clears throat> we put the introducer, we try to cross the valve, we put the wire in the, in the catheter in the ventricle, we exchange for our extra stiff wire, we bring our delivery system inside the root and we inflate our uh, transcatheter valve. In terms of the post-deployment, we don't use the TEE, uh, the TTE, neither the TEE. We look at the hemodynamics, 
we uh, calculate invasive gradient. We look, we do a root shot just to make sure there's no leak. And if we have any um, any doubt, like we're gonna ask for the echo or something like that uh, in terms of peri pericardial effusion, a leak that is more significant than we, th that than we think. Um, and we look for all of this. When we do the root shot, we look for a rupture, we look for VSD um, and that's it. <clears throat> In term, and we can dis discuss about this, um, in term of TAVR explant for us, I think this is going to be a part of our practice in the future. We see more and more in term of endocarditis. We don't see that much. We see some degenerated, but for the, the, the prosthesis that were degenerate, sometimes, oftentimes, like that was represented in the literature, not a lot of them will undergo a surgical procedure. They will if they have, even if they are at risk for endocarditis, but less for structural valve deterioration. Um, but the thing is, we will have to be able to do those type of procedure. And um, in terms of the registry that was done, 34% were not el eligible for repeat TAVR. TAVR following TAVR comes at a significant mortality burden. Those were the previous data. I think that I think that we're better at doing it and we know like the tricks to explain the valve. So the 30% mortality, I don't, I think it's a little bit um overestimate compared to what we do now. Um and the thing that they found in their explant tavern registry is was that up to 25% of those uh, of these patients were low risk surgical candidate. And they didn't mention how many of them were bicuspid versus tricuspid. But I think that it's really our job to refer our patient to the best procedure that will provide them with the long-term durability and not like to have to, to put the tavern and to have the same discussion in two years, what we're gonna do after. Because for sure, like if you have a supranular valve, your clamp will be higher. It is more difficult when it's inside, you have more chance of doing a full root procedure. The intranular is basically easier to explain, but we are developing like tricks to be able to explain those procedures safely. And the other thing that increased the mortality is that these patients oftentimes have concomitant other lesions that you're gonna address while doing your surgery. So maybe you're gonna do bypass, you're gonna repair the mitral valve or replace, you're gonna do your redo, uh, tavern explant and et cetera. So it could definitely increase the surgical risk. The tools that could help us decision process, so we're trying to develop that here. Um, it's like computer simulation for prospective planning um, that are being developing over the, the, the last decades. And um, many groups have developed accurate structural method and uh, models for simulation, um, for simulating the deployment of both balloon and self-expendable valve. And um, they have been shown to be predictive for coronary obstruction and after coronary reaccess. And, and at some point, we will have to be able to calculate what could be like the hemodynamics also in those models. I will finish by talking about the surgeon's training and participation in TAVI procedures. So this is a, a paper that, uh, so basically they, they took like uh, early career surgeons and they match us with like a little bit more senior uh, when they ask us to write this paper. And I think that was really interesting and like also to, to be with these people because like those are like pioneers as surgeons in the, um, in the transcatheter transcatheter world. And um, and I think that we're like they they open us like the 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 definitely the path to be involved in that. But um, this is a paper that we wrote, and um, we try to uh, find solution to involve like the 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 surgeons to participate and be really part of these procedures. So basically, there's built-in rotation during integrated CT surgery residency. So I think it's really important, but. I'm, we have one at the University of Montreal, it's like three months. And I think it's really like introductory. Like if you, so you, you are familiar with that, but you cannot be proficient at doing it after only three months. And I think it's not fair compared to an interventional cardiologist who's going to go and do like a structural heart fellow, like for a year. So I think that the only way a surgeon will have the credibility, it's like definitely to do a one year fellowship program. And after that, there's a lot of proctorship, um, 
that can be done and like the industry is really supportive and they are very very supportive of surgeons as well to do training on on the different platform and um and that's it um we're trying also with the society and uh, industry sponsor that to create courses and live case demonstration uh, we have attendance of national and international conference. Uh, so basically on the panel, you can see now more and more um, surgeons and interventional cardiologists. So I think it is really nice to do so. And in terms of our involvement, I think we should be involved in the pre-case planning, which means understanding the anatomy, pathophysiology, and hemodynamic of structural heart disease, the patient screening and optimization, the interpretation of multimodal cardiac imaging, the team planning to prevent, anticipate, and manage procedural complications. So all the things that we spoke about during this presentation and the management of multivalve disease with surgical, hybrid, or transcatheter procedure. And I think that this is really challenging in our practice to be consulted because the patients that we're seeing are sicker and sicker. And if sometimes you can do some hybrid stuff, combine your surgical stuff with your transcatheter stuff, I think it's really good for the patient. You can have, you need to have procedural skills in understanding the equipment and device function, sequence and troubleshooting, obtaining vascular access and closure, intra uh, imaging acquisition, um, insertion and removal of large or uh, sheets, valve crossing, delivery system manipulation, valve positioning and deployment, bailout strategy to manage complex cases, cerebral and bolic protection, transeptal puncture. Um, and after the post procedural, so basically the fast track cardiac care, management of procedural complication, and knowledge of conditions that require ongoing surveillance. Um, so in conclusion, TAVI made us aware of cyber weaknesses and surgeons need to constantly improve techniques. In the last few years, TAVI had changed the field of aortic valve uh, disease and will continue to do so with other valves as well. Trials um, include very selective patients and those were also industry sponsored trials. Uh, selection of patient is key, but many questions still, still remain and we're gonna have those uh, answer over the long term. And definitely uh, my take on this is that it is now more important than ever for surgeons to continue to leverage their knowledge and experience treating valvular disease surgically and obtain the necessary skill set to actively participate in the treatment of percutaneous structural heart disease. And you can definitely still catch the train, but I think that the formal training needs to be done. And I think that your structural training will also bring you your surgical practice and uh, you're going to do a lot of valvular surgery. You're going to do a lot of aortic surgery. So I think that really to be trained in that is really a plus for your uh, future career. And that's it. <laughs>